Okay, this is a short, going to be a short presentation podcast, if you will, uh, about Arthur Desmond, the author of Might is Right, now known to be the author of Might is Right. I think the mystery has pretty much been cleared up about who Ragnar Redbeard was. A uh, book that's fascinated me for various reasons for a long, long time. Used to publish it, can't do that anymore. Uh, did an audiobook of it, many of you may have heard. Um, I've tried to switch focus a number of times on this channel, and I'm not sure exactly if I'm on the correct pathway yet or not. However, I found uh, at a website, RagnarRedbeard.com, uh, an interesting newspaper article uh, from a Chicago paper a long, long time ago uh, about uh, a meeting at a place called the Chicago Commons. Uh, the newspaper itself, uh, what is its paper? It is see Chicago Chronicle 26 April 1896 I believe that's it if I'm not confused uh, anyway the article goes it's about a meeting that was held at Chicago Commons and uh, I'm going to read this to you. Many men of many minds discuss the doctrine of power. Principal speaker of the evening denounces all reformers. Sighs for the good old times when barons held their sway. Place where heterogeneous debates add much spice to life. Out Milwaukee Avenue way, where the streets run slantwise and the English language, when spoken at all, has a smack of countries afar off, the intersection of the great still-smelling thoroughfare called Union makes four corners. On three of these are saloons where all day and late into the night plain men in clothes glossed by wear of rough usage stand before unassuming bars and carefully plan out the salvation of the laboring classes. Near the remaining corner, a little back from the street, stands a two-story house which seems to shrink modestly from the rude gaze of unsympathetic public. This is the Chicago Commons, a small city in itself, whose socialistic ideas and utter freedom from any sort of conventionality make it such a make it such a settlement as magnified many thousand diameters would realize the dreams of Bellamy or of Karl Marx. If by chance you should call the inmates socialists, they would perhaps correct you by substituting the term sociologists. But as the central idea of the community is the sharing of what each has equal with all, and all with each, of what belongs to no one in no class, but to every, every one of the whole body, you would not perhaps feel that you had made an inexcusable error. In the basement of this building at the rear is a rude room, dignified by the pretentious title of auditorium, where the unplaned rafters hang so low as to cause the visitor to involuntarily stoop as he enters. And the naked brick walls, seamed with protruding mortar, appear to bear out the principles of the settlement in a protest against aristocracy. Here, every Tuesday night, odd discussions are held. Discussions to which are invited all men of all minds, <clears throat> excuse me, and where every religion is at liberty to have its say, and even those who have neither principles nor religion are allowed to give their views. Ragnar Redbeard, The Philosophy of Power. Such a debate was in progress last Tuesday night when a reporter and an artist for the Chronicle entered and took seats on one of the old-fashioned wooden benches, which looked as if they had been newly snatched from the Middle Ages. A tall man with a red beard, who was the principal speaker of the occasion, was declaiming on the subject, quote, might is right. He was endeavoring to prove in an argument which had 
He was endeavoring to prove in an argument which had much of sophistry in it and something of sound sense that the proposition which he discussed was true. He wanted war and blood in the survival of the fittest. With his mental hammer, he wrapped the heads of all reformers and told his audience they were all slaves and cowards and always would be to the end of time. Makes his language plain. It's a subheading. Why, he exclaimed, dramatically beating a warlike tattoo on the table nearby with one hand, while the other was outstretched as if in a threat, you are all servile villains and sneaking knaves. You have no rights. The weak will never have any rights. To the victor belongs the spoils. Your declaration of independence is a swindle. Your religious fakes your religions, fakes and humbugs, socialism a will of the wisp, anarchy just soft foolishness, and God himself a myth. We have churches on every corner and eloquent liars in every pulpit who tell the slaves and the old women, oh, be peaceful if you want to go to heaven when you die. Humble yourselves and be good. Ragnar Redbeard, The Philosophy of Power I, for my part, refuse to humble myself to any power in heaven or earth or hell, to any ghostly idea denominated as a creator or any pitchforked Satan with his tail between his legs. As for the different kinds of reforms, they are all lies and delusions. The single tax, single, <clears throat> excuse me, the single taxer will tell you that God. The single taxer will tell you that God made the land for all, but how can that be when God did not make the land at all, for God himself does not exist? If he does, who shall we say made him? If you say a superior being made God, then who made the superior being, and where does it all end? Here a small bespectacled young man who sat on a back seat arose and inquired warmly, Quote, don't you think there is something supreme in nature, that there is some force which made the universe? And do you believe any nation could exist long without the belief in this force? To which the man replied, the speaker, Yes, I think everything is ruled by force. That is my contention, and I do not think a nation will ever exist without the belief in a supreme power, simply because the great majority of all nations is composed of cringing, abject slaves, and they must have something to worship or they will not be happy. If they were not slaves, they would come and whine at your feet and beg to be made bondsmen. As to the power behind nature, what man can describe it? I admit that my intellect is too weak to grasp it. May I beg to ask, timidly, said an oldish man with side whiskers and a decidedly clerical air, what is the name of your philosophy, sir? To which the man, the speaker, replied, I haven't named it, said the orator. It is the philosophy of power. Then he returned to the socialists. Henry George is an idiot, he declared. Whoever says the land belongs to all the people is a fool. The land belongs to those who, among the people, have the energy and the courage to take it, and to none other. Every inch of land in this or in any other country has been won at the edge of the sword, and the history of it all is written in blood. Any man who tells you, you are entitled to forty acres and a cow, or three acres and a horse, or whatever he has figured out is yours by divine right, is a jackass. In the old feudal days, the owner of the lands would occasionally swoop down from his castle and take all the horses and sheep and cattle in sight, besides all the grain raised that year, and the poor slaves would submit to it and raise more. Now it is just the same. The castle today is mammon, and the slaves are the working men. Posers and the Replies If the American working man were reduced to the point of starvation, would he fight? queried an individual in a blue blouse. No, I don't think he would. He is too big a coward, replied the speaker, and everybody laughed, for they were nearly all of the laboring class who were present. What is your advice, then? My advice is to take what is yours by right of might. Take all if you can get it, just as the old warriors did in the olden days. You have but a limited time to live on this earth, and you might just as well live well 
while you are about it. Get money at any cost. Get it honestly if you can. But get it. The man with the ruddy whiskers smiled significantly as he gave this advice. Then he emulated one Silas Wegg by dropping into poetry. This is what he brought forth. And I do believe that my listeners will know this familiar stanza of poetry. Might was right when Caesar bled upon the stones of Rome. Might was right when Joshua led the troops or Jordan's foam. Might was right when German hosts rolled into Paris gay. It's the gospel of the ancient world and the logic of today. This effort, which Mr. Smith, as the lecturer, was known to the assemblage, though that is not his name, pronounced his own, was received with profound silence. Whether the members of the audience were allowing its beauties to sink deep into their minds, or whether it had found them all unprepared and caused a certain kind of a stunning sensation, nobody volunteered to say. A man with red flannel bandage around his neck said he would not have the bandage on if Mr. Smith's philosophy were true. God had given him a sore throat, and if there were no God, how could he have a sore throat, as in that case there would be no one to give it to him? This weighty argument, mm, skillfully disguised under the form of a question, was plainly unanswerable. Nobody tackled it, not even the man with the red beard, who simply sat and glowered. Thus, encouraged he of the neckcloth continued. If there was not no force behind the making of the earth, if there was not nobody to make it, then how did it get made? That's what I want to get at. Still nobody replied, and after repeating, that's what I want to get at, fiercely, as they do in Congress when they are uncommonly short on facts and long on theories, he sat down. But more trouble was in store for Mr. Smith. A husky person without a collar inquired in a strong foreign accent. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask the speaker one question. If he do not in the reformers believe, why does he come here to preach to us? I don't preach to you. I am not advocating any particular sort of reform. I don't believe anybody should work if he can help it. I would not work if I didn't have to. Then Mr. Smith launched into a drawn-out wall of hard times and trouble in store in the future that would have made McKinley and Schopenhauer feel ashamed of themselves. The newspapers tell you that this country is progressing. It is progressing, but it is progressing downward. Where are the empires of ancient times, the glory of Rome, or the grandeur of Egypt? America's going the same way, and it has not got very far to go, either. The Americans are the biggest fools in the world. Slaves elect slaves to rule them, servile villains, eloquent scoundrels who go to Congress and obey their masters, the corporations. Why, the Declaration of Independence starts out with a lie. All men are not created equal. All men are created unequal. No two men are created with the same equality. What are these inalienable rights mentioned in the Declaration? Only an assumption. They never existed. The weak have no rights. The old tribunal system was the best of all. Then the chiefs massed their forces, and whichever was the strongest got the land and everything else in sight. Originally there were only two men, and these probably fought and one made the other his slave. From the descendants of the strong men came the rulers of the world, and from those of the weak ones the slaves. Slaves they were born, and slaves they will always be. Mr. Smith had by this time about run out of epithets, but he managed to dig up a few more choice ones, and those he applied to the Democratic and Republican parties, giving them also the benefit of the old ones. Then he paid his respects to the anarchists. The anarchists, declared he for a starter, are all jackasses. They prayed about no government. No such thing as no government is possible. In the case of the two men I spoke of, the one who was victorious was the governor and the other the governed, and the socialists are not much better. It is impossible to divide up this earth's goods. The strongest will always have the bulk of it and the weak ones scraps from their table. 
Here, a conclusion was made in the recital of another original poem. This told all about a baron who owned a big castle called the Castle of Mammon. This baron feasted and had a lovely time generally until one day his servants, who were mistreated sorely, took him and dropped him out of a tenth-story window. The fall so discommoded him that the servants had a chance to go into his coffers and abstract therefrom large horny handfuls of coin in the realm, likewise jewels of rare price and gold and silver fixings, which they were enabled to pawn at the nearest shop for other coin. The speaker allowed the audience to draw its own inferences to the moral of this tragedy. Oh, after him came more speakers who debated on the subject of the evening, each being allowed five minutes. A venerable old doctor with long white beard in a passionate way denounced the tenets of the man with the russet growth on his face and declared his belief in a future state. He was rather incoherent at times and not always logical, but the violence of his gesture and the earnestness of his manner made up for any deficiency in his argument, so far as his hearers were concerned, for they applauded him lustily. Others spoke in pretty much the same strain, and one man who wore glasses and had a scholarly air resented the attack on socialism and made mysterious references to various authorities, which he intimated by his manner. He could quote if he would. Objects of Chicago Commons, as in objections of Chicago Commons. The Chicago Commons, although it allows these heterogeneous debates to be conducted before it, is a Christian organization. The second clause of the Articles of Incorporation under the laws of Illinois gives its objectives. The object for which it is formed is to provide a center for a higher civic and social life, to initiate and maintain religious, educational, and philanthropic enterprises, and to investigate and improve conditions in the industrial districts of Chicago. At the present, three family groups, including five young children, dwell at the commons. These groups include nine men and nine women, and at the head of them are Professor Graham Taylor, Reverend B.F. Bola, and John P. Gravitt. A kindergarten school is taught in the community, as is also music. Among the recent speakers and their topics have been Clarence Darrow on the social outlook, Dr. C.A.F. Lindum on the scientific basis of equality, unquote, O.A. Bishop on socialism, unquote, Mrs. Catherine Waugh McCullough on social purity, unquote, William Howard, president of the Longshore Men's Union on, quote, the duties of labor leaders, unquote, F.M. Wilkes on relation of socialism to the single tax, Stoughton Cooley on proportional representation, and John Lloyd on, quote, the church and social reform, unquote. Topics in prospect are, quote, single tax in its relation to socialism, heredity, and intermarriage. There's another article here dated the Chicago, it's the Chicago Chronicle, 26th April, oh, excuse me, Chicago Commons, March 1899, Tuesday meeting. I'm not sure which of these dates is correct. Uh, it seems to be from two different papers. And I think we'll do the other one in a second video because this is already almost 20 minutes long.